How's everybody doing today? Hope everybody's doing well. Come on, join in. Share this broadcast here on social media platforms. It's Black History Month, African American History Month. So we have a lot of information to discuss today. Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it's Black History Month 2023, and the annual theme for Black History Month uh, this year is Black, um, Black Resistance and Black Resistance Movements. But one of the pieces of, of history that's oftentimes left out when we deal with Black History Month is the African presence in the Americas before Christopher Columbus and before slavery. OK, and that's what we're going to talk about today. All right. Africans in America before Native Americans, Columbus or slavery. And we'll also talk about uh, my new 12 week online class that starts up Saturday, uh, February 11th, uh, 2023, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and you can register for uh, that new 12-week online course. Okay, so uh, let's jump into this conversation. And uh, we'll also talk about the uh, free lecture that I'm doing uh, for Black History Month on uh, each Saturday in February. Uh, and the free lecture begins at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we have the information at our website also, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. All right, if we look at the, uh, I'm going to go to the PowerPoint presentation here. Because oftentimes at the Black History Month uh, celebrations, they'll just talk about uh, slavery or they may talk about the Civil War. They may talk about inventions that African Americans created, things, things of this nature. That's important. But it's also important to understand the history of African people in the Americas and the land we call the United States of America before slavery began. So th there was an article from uh, facetofaceafrica.com um, a few years ago, back in uh, January 23rd, 2015. And this article was called 10 Pieces of Evidence That Prove Black People Sailed to the Americas Long Before Columbus. 10 Pieces of Evidence That Prove Black people sailed to the Americas long before Columbus. Um, and I'm going to look at a number of different sources here for this presentation. But one of the uh, pieces of evidence is Columbus himself and his writings, his journal entries, because Columbus kept a journal as well. And in the online class that I teach, we definitely deal with Christopher Columbus because Columbus is uh, crucial to understanding the uh, expansion of the transatlantic slave trade, okay? And Columbus is also connected to the African Moors as well, especially after the Moors lose control of the last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. So according to a uh, renowned American historian and linguist, uh, Leo Weiner of Harvard University, one of the one of the strongest pieces of evidence to support the fact that uh, black people or African people sailed, African people sailed to the Americas, um, sailed to America before Christopher Columbus, was a journal entry from Columbus himself. In uh, Leo Weiner's book entitled Africa and the Discovery of America, Africa and the Discovery of America, um, Leo Weiner explains that Columbus noted in his journal that the Native Americans confirmed, quote, black skinned people had come from the southeast in boats trading in gold tipped spears. Black people, black skinned people had come from the southeast in, in boats trading in gold tipped spears. OK, so we're going to see. Um, African people sailing much earlier than we originally were told, than we originally thought. Okay, we're going to see that when we study this history. Also, when um, uh, we 
look at Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And this is a book that we use um, in, in the class also. And if you've seen any of the interviews that I've done with Dr. David M. Hotep, you know, I've interviewed him about 13 times or so uh, over the years since about 2012, something like that. All right. So this is one of the books we use in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along. Uh, we show you excerpts of the book on the screen usually uh, or uh, take excerpts and put into a, a, a slide in the PowerPoint presentation. The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel in his new book, which came out around October 2021. It's The First Americans Were Africans uh, Revised and Expanded. Now, the discovery. Um, so also another piece of evidence that we have of uh, the African presence in the Americas before Columbus um, and also before slavery. American narcotics discovered in Egyptian mummies. American narcotics discovered in Egyptian mummies. Now, the discovery of American narcotics in Egyptian mummies has left some historians amazed. Recently, archaeologists discovered the presence of uh, narcotics only known to be derived from American plants in ancient Egyptian mummies. The, uh, these substances included South American cocaine from uh, anthroxylon and nicotine uh, from nico uh, nicotiana tobacco. Now, German toxicologist uh, Svetla Balabanova reported his, the findings which suggests that such compounds made their way to Africa through transatlantic trade, through transatlantic trade that would predate Christopher Columbus' arrival by thousands of years. Now, it's also important to understand, and when I speak during uh, African American History Month celebrations, a lot of times, especially a lot of elders, a lot of seniors are surprised to hear this, but Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. And we deal with this in the class. Um, Columbus goes into uh, the Caribbean. He goes into Puerto Rico and Honduras and Panama, uh, the Bahamas, things like this. Uh, Cuba, the closest he comes to uh, the land we call the United States of America is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. All right. So this is another reason why it's strange that you have statues of Christopher Columbus and busts of Christopher Columbus um, here in the U.S. And he never even came to this land. Now, a lot of that, that, that basically dates back to the Italian influence and also uh, President Benjamin Harrison trying to appease Italian-Americans after you had 11 uh, Italians who were lynched. It was around the 1890s. They were lynched and uh, Italy almost goes to war with the U.S. over this, okay? But when you actually understand the history, it's like, wait a second, Columbus never even came to the land that we call the United States of America. So why we had these statues of, of Christopher Columbus here in, in the U.S.? All right, let's continue. How's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. And we'll give you information about our new 12-week online class that starts up Saturday, February 11th, just in time for African American History Month. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com for more information and to register. Now, um, when we look at Egyptian artifacts or ancient Kemetic artifacts in North America, uh, for years, Eurocentric archaeologists have largely have largely turned a blind eye when it came to the discovery of artifacts from ancient Egypt being discovered in uh, the Americas. According to Dr. David M. Hotep, who's a friend of mine, no relation, the author uh, behind the book, The First Americans, First Americans were Africans documented evidence. Egyptian artifacts, quote, Egyptian artifacts found across North America from the Algonquin writings uh, on the uh, on the East Coast to the artifacts and Egyptian place names in the Grand Canyon. OK, 
Egyptian artifacts found across across North America from the Algonquin writings, which is a uh, Algonquin is a nation of Native Americans. OK, and they have African roots. Also, the Algonquin Algonquin writings on the East Coast to the artifacts and Egyptian place names in the Grand Canyon, end quote, are all signs of an early arrival in the Americas by Africans are all signs of an early arrival in the America in the Americas by Africans. Th this is also paired with a much earlier account of black people with incredible skills at sea. OK, so we we've been sailing for tens of thousands of years. And there was a discovery that came out in 2010 on the Greek island of Crete. Which um, suggested that humans were sailing 130,000 years ago. All right. And and I found out about that discovery from Dr. David M. Hotep. So I, I deal with that in a lot of my presentations. And we talk about that in the class also. Uh, so, so back in uh, 445 BC or BCE before the common era, the Greek historian Herodotus, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote of King Ramses III leading a team of Africans at sea with astounding seafaring and navigational skills. Together, both accounts would point to Africans sailing over to the New World before Cristobal Colon or Christopher Columbus. When we look at the Olmecs in Mexico and Olmec heads in Mexico, um, we look at the uh, so Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in uh, the first Americans or Africans documented evidence. He talks about the Mandinka Egyptian Olmec connection, the Mandinka Egyptian Olmec connection. OK, and if we look at this here. Let's go back to this slide here just a second. All right. So a major ethnic group among ancient Egyptians, a major ethnic group among the ancient Egyptian Nubians um, were the Manding people, the Manding or Mandinka. Uh, you also hear the term Mandingo. Uh, but, it's, but you have the Mending or the Mandinka. Uh, and an original Niger Congo homeland in the general vicinity of the Upper Nile Valley is probably as good a hypothesis as any for the origin of the Manding. The uh, proto Manding migration had taken place before the African aqualithic period. That was a wet period in Africa that lasted thousands of years. OK, that was a wet period in Africa that lasted thousands of years at a time when the Sahara was uh, fertile and had river systems. And great lakes. OK, so this comes from um, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. Now, the Nile flowed west across the Sahara and emptied into the Atlantic Ocean during very ancient times. Uh, this would have enabled East Africans direct access to the Atlantic Ocean. The longer route, the longer route would be to sail to the Nile River North to the Mediterranean Sea and then head west to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, when the Manding um, reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Omics. The Omics were supposedly a mixture of the Manding uh, or Mandinka and, um, uh, and Amerians or Amer American Indians or Native Americans. Do not forget that the Manding made up the base of the Omics. So the Egyptians, the Manding and the base of the Omics are related to each other. This comes from page 82 of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. Now, in 1311 A.D., 
or common era, thousands of years after the Omec arrive, the Mandinkan uh, uh, Muslim Abu Bakari II, okay, the ruler of the Mali Empire, Abu Bakari II, sailed 2,000 ships from Mali, West Africa, in the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Ocean headed west. When they reached South America, they left signs on the rocks at the mouths of rivers warning followers of dangerous or friendly natives. This comes from page 88 of uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. So now there's a, a interesting article that face to face Africa.com has. And we post a lot of articles from face to face Africa.com as well here on our fan page, the African history network and uh, my personal page, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. So, uh, there's an article way before Columbus, ancient Malayans sailed to the Americas in 1311. Okay, this is from December uh, 5th, 2018. Now, according to a number of sources, Abu Bakr II, uh, who, was, who was the Mansa or king of the Mali Empire in the 14th century, this is before Mansa Musa. He led uh, Malayan sailors to the uh, Americas, specifically present day Brazil, almost 200 years before Christopher Columbus, before Christopher Columbus arrived. Abu Bakari II ruled what was arguably the richest and largest empire on earth, covering nearly all of West Africa. Now the BBC uh, reported in an article uh, called Africa's Greatest Explorer, Africa's Greatest Explorer. Uh, this article came out December 13th to, in the year 2000. Uh, they reported on um, the book, The Saga of Abu Bakari II. He left with, with 2,000 boats. This book is by Malayan scholar um, uh, Gausu uh, Diarawa. And in the book, he notes, Abu Bakari wanted to find out whether the Atlantic Ocean, like the great river Niger that swept through Mali, had another bank. He had traveled extensively throughout and outside of the African continent, already owning most of the continent. His predecessor and uncle, uh, Sundiata Keita, had already founded the Mali Empire and conquered a good stretch of the Sahara Desert and the great forests along the West African coast. And here is a, um, here's, uh, so I read the article from the BBC. This is the article right here. I'm going to pull this up so you can take a look at this. This is from, um, this article came out in the year 2000 from the BBC. And let me increase the size of this here. Okay, this one right here. Let's flip over to this. How's everybody doing? Give us a heart, give us a like, give us a thumbs up on this broadcast. It's African American History Month. We're done with a topic that's not talked about a lot. We're done with the African presence in the Americas before slavery, before Christopher Columbus. And we're also talking about the African presence in the land we call the United States of America. And we're giving you a preview of um, the new 12 week online class that I'm teaching starting that starts Saturday, February 11th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school, okay? So this is a 12 week online class. It'll be Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Information is right on the homepage. You can start you can register for the class. There's bonus content that you'll watch. You'll get five uh, bonus lectures from me uh, when you register as well. It's uh, loaded up into our online school. And even after the 12 week class is over with, you'll still have access to the full course. So you can still go back and watch it anytime. And you can use this information with your children. Also, I would say the content is PG 13. Okay. 
so Africa's greatest explorer, this is uh article here from uh the BBC. So check this out. Uh check out this article also. All right, let's continue here. Let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation. All right. So when we look at Massa Musa also, and uh, Massa Musa is also compared to uh, T'Challa in the film Black Panther. And in the uh, online course, we talk about the movie Black Panther and the African influences that we see. We deal with how the film Black Panther relates to African history, culture, language, spiritual systems. But there was a good article from history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel. This article came out uh, a month after the first Black Panther movie came out. Uh, and in this article, it said, in the vast fictional universe of Marvel Comics, T'Challa, better known as Black Panther, is not only king of Wakanda, is not only king of Wakanda, he's also the richest superhero of them all. And although today's fight for the title of wealthiest person alive involves a tug of war between billionaire CEOs, the wealthiest person in history, Mansa Musa, has become has more in common with Marvel's first black superhero. Has more in common than Marvel's first black superhero. Mansa Musa became ruler of the Mali Empire in 1312 A.D. or Common Era, taking the throne after his predecessor Abubakar II. Uh, for whom he'd served as deputy, went missing on a voyage he took by sea to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, uh, Mansa Musa's rule came at, came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources, due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. During that period, the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt. Now, the name of this article is the uh, this 14th century African emperor remains the richest person in history. This is from history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel. And it came out March 19th, uh, 2018. So they're telling you, this is the History Channel, telling you that West Africa was flourishing when uh, Europe was uh, trying to come out of the dark ages and Europe was dealing with civil war and famine different things like this. Uh, West Africa is flourishing. Okay. So the, the history is there and it's, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say that the history is hidden. It's not so much as hidden. It's just not as prominent as the lie is. Okay. If you, you know, the information is there, but a lot of times people don't know where to go to get the information. OK, and the lie is what is dominant. The lie is what is prominent. All right, let's continue. So when we look at an um, African presence in early America before Columbus or slavery, we look at the, this African presence. Uh, there was an article uh, that Renoko Rashidi, who was a friend of mine, I interviewed Renoko six times before he passed away August 2nd, uh, 2021. Um, it was an article that Renoko Rashidi wrote called Before Enslavement, Africa's Ancient Diaspora. He wrote this article for uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com. In the article, he said, sculptural and skeletal and skeletal remains, sculpt sculptural and skeletal remains found in ancient Olmec sites provided the most conclusive evidence yet discovered concerning the presence of African people in, the, in America before Columbus. The most pronounced and widely 
acknowledged Afrocoid sculptural representations to appear in the ancient New World were produced by the Olmec. Now, uh, nearly 20 colossal stone heads, nearly 20 colossal stone heads weighing 10 to 40 tons have been unearthed in Olmec sites along the Mexican Gulf Coast. One of the first European American scientists to comment on the Olmec heads uh, was uh, archaeologist Matthew Sterling, Matthew Sterling, S T I R L I N G. And he described their facial features as, quote, amazingly Negroid, end quote. Amazingly Negroid, end quote. Now, other scientists have found a host of cultural parallels between ancient Africans and Native Americans, between ancient Africans and Native Americans, including architectural patterns uh, and religious practices and religious practices. As for the latter, some referring to religious practices, some Native American communities worshiped black gods or black deities of, of great antiquity, okay, like Quetzalcoatl, um, Ek, uh, Ek, Ekua, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Y-A-L-A-H-A-U, okay, so you're going to see a number of black gods that Native Americans uh, worship. The other thing that's important to understand is that you're going to have because so the Khoisan are here in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. We'll come to that information shortly. They have the oldest DNA on the planet. They go all around the world. You're going to have a presence from the Mandinka that are here as well, uh, like in Mexico and in this land. There's a, a pre, there's a. Uh, a presence from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, that's here also in this land. When you have European settlers who come here, you're going to have groups of Africans who get reclassified as Native Americans. And this is one of the ways that our population is, is uh, absorbed. So if you don't understand that history that happened before Europeans got here, then you'll think that we uh, African people first came to this land, conquered and shackled in chains, conquered by Europeans. And that's not true. This was our land stolen from us. We were here even before Native Americans came into existence. Now, this is not an attack on Native Americans. This is just this is just understanding the history. OK, we were we were here in this land even before Native Americans came into existence. And this is one of the things that Dr. David M. Hotep breaks down in his book and, and backs it up. His book is backed up by 713 footnotes and seven peer review art articles and archeological evidence, et cetera. So when we have our Black History Month or African-American History Month celebrations, and, we, and when we honor Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915 in Chicago, and created Negro History Week uh, to be celebrated the second week in February, starting in 1926. When we celebrate African American History Month, we have to understand Dr. Carter G. Woodson. We have to understand why this monthly cultural celebration was created. But it does not, it was never designed just to deal with uh, our history and accomplishments in the United States of America, but also on the continent of Africa and throughout the diaspora as well. So we have to understand how all that is connected, but we have to deal with the history and take back our minds and deal with the history prior to Europeans coming to this land. And, I, you know, I speak at a number of different, uh, it was in the past, uh, uh, spoken at a number of different Black History Month celebrations. And unfortunately, this type of information is not discussed there usually. All right. Now, during his third voyage, because Columbus went on four voyages uh, from 1492 to about 1504 or so, he dies in 1506. During Columbus' third voyage, he recorded that when he reached Haiti, and Haiti is on the island of Hispaniola, 
okay, the western third of the island of Hisp Hispaniola that was first conquered by Columbus, okay? He first con uh, is first conquered by Columbus around 1494. Uh, then is going to come under control by the French in 1697. Now, during Columbus' third voyage, he recorded that when he reached Haiti um, or Haiti, the resident population informed him that black men from the south and southeast had preceded him to the island, okay, of, of Haiti, Haiti, uh, that the uh, French called Saint Dominique, the Spanish called uh, Santo Domingo. Now, in 1513, common era, uh, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, the Spanish conquistador, found a colony of black men on his arrival in, in Darien, Central America. In Darien, Central America. Okay, now there's an article from uh, 1975 by... Uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. We know Dr. Ivan Van Sertima wrote the book They Came Before Columbus. There's an article from the New York Times uh, that Dr. Ivan Van Sertima wrote called Bad News for Columbus, Perhaps. Bad News for Columbus, Perhaps. This is from December 4th, 1975. In an excerpt of uh, this article, uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima says, in September 1974, a Polish craniologist Andre uh, Andre Wazinski disclosed to the Congress of Americanists that skulls from Olmec and other pre-Christian sites in Mexico okay show a clear prevalence of the total Negroid pattern show a clear prevalence of the total Negroid pattern now, in 1957, three professors released radiocarbon uh, datings for an Olmec ceremonial center at La Yenta, Mexico. Within, the cent within this center, near the Atlantic, stood four colossal stone heads with military-type helmets weighing 30 to 40 tons each, weighing 30 to 40 tons each. They were described by their uh, discoverer, the archeologist Matthew Sterling as quote unquote, amazingly Negroid, amazingly Negroid. Now samples of wood, charcoal, uh, samples of wood charcoal taken from the first construction phase of the center associated with the heads, the Omec heads, gave an average reading of, of about 814 BC before the common era or BCE, 8, 814 BC plus or minus 134 years. Now, uh, Professor Alexander uh, von Wuthenau, an art historian, has uh, brought to public attention numerous Negroid portraits in clay, gold, copper, and copal from ancient and medieval Central and South America. These uh, portraits capture not only the dense close curl, C-U-R-L, close curl and kink of Negroid hair or African hair, Africoid hair, the occasional goatee beard unknown to the American Indian chin, projecting jaws, coloration, broad noses and full fleshed lips, but also African ear pendants, African ear pendants, headdresses, coiffures, facial tattoos, and scarification. Now, these discoveries have posed riddles to many anthropologists. They ask how could Africans who knew nothing of the sea cross the 1500 uh, Atlantic miles to America? OK, well, they were wrong if they thought African people knew nothing of the sea. We've been settling for tens of thousands of years. That's just that's just false. Africans, however, the, uh, so Dr. Ivan Van Sertima goes on to say Africans, however, were no strangers to the sea. 
um, Irish pre-Christian history records how the um, uh, Furbages, uh, F-I-R-B-O-U-R-G-E-S, were, quote, disturbed in their possession of Ireland by the descent and depredations of African sea rovers, the Fomorians, had a main stronghold on Torre Island. When we look at, oh, and let me show you this article. So this is a, a, a article from the New York Times that I read. Um, and it's from uh, 1975. Let me pull this up here. Okay, yeah, from December 4th, 1975. All right, you can post your comments here. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. This type of information, uh, we don't hear a lot. Oftentimes during Black History Month, um, and there's an annual theme for Black History Month every year. There's been an annual theme since 1928. So if you've seen some of my presentations, if you heard my show, um, if you heard my show on Sunday night, the African History Network show, you know, we talked about that as well. And I'm going to post the article uh, that I updated, the article I wrote a few years ago about the origins of Black History Month. But you can register for the online class also uh, that we have starting up on Saturday, February 11th, 2023, class number one of this 12-week online history class that I teach called Ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, where we get deep into uh, this type of history. Okay, so this article right here, this is from the New York Times. Bad news for Columbus, perhaps. Bad news for Columbus, perhaps. But the Van Sertima, he goes through and lays this information out. You may have to, I'm not sure, you may have to get a subscription to the New York Times, a digital subscription to read that because it's in their archives. I have a digital subscription. So I read the New York Times, Washington Post every day. Okay, let's continue here. Also, uh, we have the information on the homepage of our website. Uh, so Saturday, on Saturdays, we're doing two things. Um, each Saturday in February, I'm teaching a free, um, I'm doing a free uh, Black History Month lecture at 12 noon on Saturday. Okay, so Saturday, February 11th, 12 noon to 1.30 p.m., uh, I'm doing a free Black History Month lecture, and it's dealing with Black resistance movements. All right, if you missed if you missed the one that I did on February fourth, click on this link right here. You can you can watch it. We have it archived, uh, and it's at our online school platform. And then you can also register for the one that I'm doing on Saturday, February eleventh. Uh, starts at twelve noon. Then at two p.m. Um, uh, on Saturday, class number one starts up of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so you can register for that course. You can use this information with your children. I would say the information is PG-13. This class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch the course. The class is on demand. And even after the 12 week online course is over with, you still have access to the full class. So you can still uh, watch as much as you want to a year from now, two years from now, you can watch the entire class. We have a bundle pack also because we have uh, my second class that I teach is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968. Class number one of that class will start up Sunday, February 26, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, same format, same cost for that one. Uh, but you can register for both classes in a bundle pack. You get a discount 
so this this is a three hundred dollar value. You get it for one hundred twenty dollars, both classes, and then also there's uh, five bonus lectures of mine that you're going to get also. Okay, and if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email us at ahn show at the African History Network dot com, ahn show at the African History Network dot com. Uh, or you can just email us right through the website and you'll get uh, 50 percent off the course bundle. OK, if you've taken uh, any of my online classes in the past, I've been teaching online classes, uh, online history classes since 2017. All right, let's continue. And we have the information also here in the thread of the broadcast for you to uh, register for the classes also and the in uh, the free lecture on Saturday. All right, let's continue. OK, so when we look at um, Indian and African mound builders, Indian and African mound builders, and there were at one point a million mounds here in this land we call the United States of America, at least 10,000 years ago during the African aqualithic period, the mound builders of Africa, the mound builders of Africa, uh, the proto manding were building habitation mounds to live up, to live upon even before the manding built their mounds along the Niger River. These proto Saharan people also built dams, boats, and mounds to escape the waters in case of flooding. There are also large erections formerly called Native American mounds formerly called Native American mounds, now known to be African mounds that are shaped like pyramids that are found across North America. The largest ones surviving today are in the Mississippi Valley, the Mississippi Valley. The largest of all was in Cahokia, was the Cahokia Mound, C-A-H-O-K-I-A. -A. The research Cahokia, okay, that mound is still there. All right. And that's like the largest mound in the basically in the land we call the United States of America. The largest of all was the Cahokia Mound near um, uh, uh, near where the Mississippi and Missouri rivers converge. Now, uh, Cyrus Thomas, who's director of the Eastern Mound Division of the Smithsonian Institute's Bureau of Ethnology in 1881 said, quote, distinct from the American Indians, there was a race of mound builders in America distinct from the American Indians. OK, now there were one million Indian mounds in North America. Today, there are only about 100,000. Uh, read pages 71 through 74 of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. So in his book, um, and there's a clip that I show you uh, of an interview that uh, he did with uh, WKRP in Cincinnati, Channel 5 in, uh, in uh, Cincinnati, when, uh, and he's talking about his book. Uh, on page 14 of his book, he deals with this discovery that was made in Allendale County, South Carolina in um, 2004, 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, okay? Al Allendale County, South Carolina. All right, and Lavinia said, I'm very close to the Cahokia Mound Mountains. Okay, so you know what we're talking about, Lavinia. Uh, and I sent you an email. Uh, I think you got my email also, Lavinia. All right, so page 14 of his book, says evidence of an African presence uh, 51,700 years ago in a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina. This was discovered by Dr. Uh, archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear. So they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in the land that we call the United States of America uh, going back at least 51,700 years ago. So they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, 
genetic M174 D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. Okay, they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting the African presence here. So these were the Khoisan. Okay, the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They go all around the world. And um, these are the short statured Africans and they were here. So you have, uh, and, and unfortunately, when we have uh, African-American History Month celebrations, right? This type of information is not covered. OK, we'll, we'll talk about slavery. We'll talk about civil rights movement. Uh, we may talk about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Dr. King, Malcolm X. All that's important. All that's important. But we need to we need to start the conversation. With the fact that African people are the original people in North, Central and South America. Now, I'm not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. That, that's. No, not at all. I'm saying African people were here in this land tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happened. There were numerous migrations to this land, either forced or voluntary. OK, so we have to understand a chronology of history. And oftentimes, you know, unfortunately, we don't get the full uh, we, we don't get the, the full benefit. Uh, of Black History Month is not as powerful as it could be if we had a better understanding of history and the chronology of history, but also understand that their annual themes each year for, for, for Black History Month. And these annual themes give you direction and it gives you topics to discuss in your celebrations. So this year's annual theme coming from Asala, which is the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, which is the organization of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's known as the father of black history and the one who created Negro History Week in 1926. This is the organization he co-founded in September 1915. It was Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. There's been an annual theme since 1928. There's been an annual theme for Black History Month since 1928. So if you celebrate Black History Month and don't know there's an annual theme, what have you been celebrating? This is this year's annual theme is Black Resistance, Black Resistance. So each Saturday in February, I'm doing a, a free lecture before I teach my online class. I'm doing a free lecture centered around Black Resistance movements, which falls in line with this year's annual theme. OK, so visit our website, the African History Network dot com and be sure to register for the for the free lecture that I'm doing also. OK, uh, we did one. Um, we did one uh, Saturday, February 4th, and it was scheduled for three hours. I ended up doing four hours and we got in deep into some history. OK, <laughs> so <laughs> we got into so much history there. Um it, and it's still archived, so you can go back and watch. You can still register for it. It's, it's on our website. You can still register for it and, and go back and watch it. And here is the, I'm going to post the link here uh, so you can register for the free lecture that's coming up uh, Saturday, February 11th also at 12 noon. Okay, so I'm doing this. I do the free lecture at 12 noon, and then I teach the uh, online class at 2 p.m., okay? But the um, the online lecture at the Black History Month lecture at um, at twelve noon that that's a uh, that's a free presentation. Okay, let me post this here just a second. Where is it? All right. it is here and we have it uh on the home page of our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com also all right let's continue so if you like this type of information 
be sure to register for the online lecture be sure to support the african history network register for the online classes also you can support us dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show because it takes a lot of resources to be able to teach these classes run the african history network pay for all these services pay the bills etc okay so we have our cash app and paypal information on the home page of our website uh as well so if you learn anything from this presentation be sure to support us all right let's continue now here is a uh picture of dr albert goodyear uh so he's a white uh archaeologist and he's at odds with the establishment archaeologists and, and there's some different articles that we look at in the class because we look at um a numerous archaeological discoveries that have come out in the past 15 years or so that are causing uh all the scientists and paleontologists uh and anthropologists etc to rethink everything okay to rethink everything and it's caused and when these discoveries come out it, it causes them to push the timelines back okay uh they have to admit that all of this is much older um th that this is much older than uh we thought and let's see here radio uh, so he, now this article is from sciencedaily.com sciencedaily.com new evidence puts man in north america fifty thousand years ago and it's from november 18th 2004. so this article is almost 20 years old um radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last may along the savannah river in allendale county by university of south carolina uh archaeologist dr albert goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least fifty thousand years old meaning that humans inhabited north america long before the last ice age so this is a summary of the uh, actual uh article and this is not my summary of the article this is the summary from sciencedaily.com now the article is still there you can go read it right you can go read it when you finish watching this broadcast new evidence puts man in north america fifty thousand years ago so who who were these who was this who were these people who who were these humans they weren't europeans there's no evidence of europeans on, on the face of the earth fifty thousand years ago uh you have evidence of europeans coming to existence about uh right around uh, about three about six thousand years ago or so give or take about six thousand years ago these weren't Native Americans. Who were they? These were the Khoisan. All right, now this article from um, this article is from the New York Times. This is from February 15th, 2010. It's called On Crete, New Evidence of Very Ancient Mariners on crete new evidence of very ancient mariners uh and i found out about this article from uh, dr david m hotel okay and then i read it and when different archaeological discoveries would come out oftentimes i would email him uh, about the update and we uh, call him we'll discuss it uh and sometimes we, we talk about it in some of the interviews that, that i've done with them so this discovery is causing the scientists to have to rethink everything here's a excerpt of the article it says stone tools on the greek island of crete c-r-e-t-e -E, over two summers archaeologists uh say are at least 130,000 years old or at least 130,000 years old which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. 
okay, are at least 130,000 years old which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human culture. So they're saying we, we have to rethink all this stuff. All this stuff is much older than we thought. Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous, uh, previous artifact discoveries had shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia no earlier than a, than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So once again, th th they're saying, wait a second. We have to push the timelines back. Okay, we thought earlier seafaring in the Mediterranean uh, was 10,000, 12,000 years ago, but now we're seeing evidence and we have to push that timeline back to 130,000 years ago. Now this, this goes to something that this goes to uh, something that uh, Renoka Rashidi, uh, Dr. Charles Finch, and other uh, African citizen scholars have been talking about for years. And they've been saying that uh, modern man, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, they've been saying that they are at least 300,000 years old as opposed to 75,000 to 100,000 years old. And at least 130,000 years of our history is stolen. And as these archaeological discoveries keep coming out, it's, it's flipping the archaeological world upside down. And it's shocking the scientists, and they just have to keep pushing the timelines back. So we deal with a number of different archaeological discoveries in like the first two uh, sessions of the class. So we can set a, a good foundation to dig into this history because we can't start studying our history in slavery. Even when we study the history of African people in this country, we, we were here for going back tens of thousands of years. So when I, the, the type of classes I teach and when I do my black history month presentations, things like this is an entirely different type of presentation. All right, how y'all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like. Uh, be sure to visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Register for the uh, free online uh, Black History Month lecture I'm doing on uh, Saturday, 12 noon, to, uh, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, and register for the online class also on Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. Now, the article goes on to say, from the New York Times, February, and this is from the science section of the New York Times, by the way. It goes on to say, even more intriguing, the archaeologists who found the tools on Crete noted that the style of the hand axis suggested that they could be up to 700,000 years old. Now, they admit that may be a stretch. That's true. That may be a stretch. They conceded but the tools resemble artifacts from the stone technology known as Eshulin, Eshulin, A-C-H-E-U-L-E-A-N, which originated with pre-human populations in Africa between 150,000 years ago and 1.5 million years ago. Now, they go on to say, because some people, you know, when, and I've, when I've talked about this discovery in the past, you know, I have some uh, people on social media, some white people, uh, not a lot, but he has some idiots who will say, oh, they found a couple of stone tools or something like that, trying to dismiss the discovery, right? No, it wasn't a couple of stone tools. It wasn't two. It wasn't 20. It wasn't 200. They found more than 2,000 stone artifacts. They found more than 2,000 stone artifacts over the course of two summers 
on the Greek island of Crete, including the hand axes. These were collected on the southwestern shore of Crete. So the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. But even on the continent of Africa, they're having to push the timelines back also, the archaeologists, right? So this discovery here came out June uh, 2017, and all the news outlets uh, had stories about this archaeological discovery. And this is from um, uh, NBCnews.com, this particular one, but all of them reported, Washington Post, New York Times. I read, I read uh, articles from numerous... Uh, uh, news outlets we're older than we thought we're older than we thought new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years uh-oh new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years so not only were we here in this land going back much longer tens of thousands of years before we uh, first thought or before we were first told we came here. This is one of the problems I have with the 1619 project. You keep wanting to start our history in this, in this land and slavery. No, that's, that's false. The six August 20th, 1619 did happen. 1526 did happen in uh, the territory that South Carolina and Georgia, when the Spanish were taking Africans into uh, uh, the territory of South Carolina and Georgia and the Spanish were trying to set up a settlement and the Africans overthrew them and disappeared and it's believed they went to go live with Native Americans. That did happen. Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador, came into Florida in 1513 with an African named Juan Garrido who was born in West Africa in 1480. That did happen. But you got to deal, before you start talking about 1619, you got to deal with thousands of years of history of an African presence here in this land. Don't put us, don't, don't, don't make it seem like we first came to this, came to this land conquered and shackled in chains, conquered by Europeans. If that's where you start your history, you already start grossly behind in history, and you start with your with with your mind arrested. You start with your mind already conquered in chains. You already start diminished, dehumanized. Stripped of African history, culture, language, spiritual systems, land, mores, family ties, nationality, all of that. So, yes, there's some factual information in, in the 1619 Project, but, the, but, but their, their basis, their foundation is grossly flawed, is grossly flawed, grossly historically accurate. You got to deal with history before those Africans were, 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 were uh, on, on the white lion pirate ship. In, that comes into uh, Hampton, is actually Hampton, Virginia, comes into Hampton, Virginia, August 20, 1619, in our exchange for uh, food and water uh, and supplies. And in 1619, codified slave laws didn't even exist in any of the 13 colonies. They're put into a form of indentured servitude and, and they will be released after three to five years. First colony that had codified slave laws in Massachusetts in 1641. They come to Virginia about 1660, 1661. The whole way the history evolved here in this country is not even the way uh, the, the way we think all this evolved is not even how it happened. Because the way that the history is told is that, oh, you know, all the colonies had slavery when those Africans, uh, the Kumbundu speaking um, Africans from uh, Angola. OK, because those those were Africans from Angola. Uh, we're taught, you know, oh, they, they they had slavery here in the 13 colonies in 1619. No, they didn't. If you read chapter two of Before the Mayflower belong, uh, uh, by Lerone Bennett Jr., and that's one of the books we use in the class. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class, but this is one of the books we use in the class. You read chapter two. He deals with how all this evolved. And then you have to deal with Bacon's Rebellion in 1675 and 1676, where you had a, uh, a armed revolt by enslaved Africans, uh, free African-Americans, white indentured servants, uh, poor white people, poor white immigrants. And they all united because they were being mistreated on the tobacco plantations in Virginia 
and they saw that they had a common enemy who were the ruling elite, the wealthy class, and they all united against them and had a rebellion. And, and in about 1676, they burned down the, the, the town of, of, of Jamestown, Virginia in 1676. This is Bacon, Nathaniel Bacon, who was a wealthy tobacco plantation owner. He led this rebellion. It's called Bacon's Rebellion. And it's going to be after Bacon's Rebellion, right about 1681, that the colony of Virginia introduces on a widespread usage, the widespread usage of the term white, where previously they referred to Europeans as Englishmen or Christians, but they're going to use the term white to designate these, these English, the Englishmen or English women. Because they're trying to break up the alliance between enslaved Africans, uh, free African Americans, and then some also um, uh, uh, black or African indentured servants, and then the poor whites and white indentured servants. They're trying to break up that alliance between them. Okay. Then this, this leads to 1705, the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705, which incidentally, Section 4 of the Virginia Slave Codes makes a distinction between the treatment of Negroes and the treatment of Moors, M-O-O-R-S. So you have to, we have to understand this history, understand how we got here, the laws and policies put in place to understand where we need to go from here. So if we look at this, we're older than we thought, new find pushes human origin back. Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought, researchers reported Wednesday. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago, 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. OK, 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. Now, check this out. New discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belong to modern homo sapiens, modern homo sapiens modern man and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago the earliest previous homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago so this discovery here blew it out the water okay number one number two like i said you know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen so the earliest known uh, remains date back 195,000 years ago. That goes back to about 1974 in Ethiopia. And then we have Morocco, North Africa, over 100,000 years before that. Okay, an African presence. And this is of modern man. The earliest previous Homo sapien bones date back 195,000 years ago, and they're clear across the continent in modern-day Ethiopia. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. So we go through and, and, and look at this history. We look at a chronology of history uh, throughout the course, throughout the 12 week online course that starts up um, Saturday, February 11th, 2023, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. All right. So uh, and we look at the history of the Moors as well, definitely, because the Moors take the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into the, and, uh, you know, take the teachings, teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa. They take this into Europe and this is going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. So who were the Moors? OK, the Moors ancestors were known as the Garamantes. Uh, these were a black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barca was a uh, Garamanti as well as St. Augustine. And we talk about Hannibal Barca and the uh, Battle of Kanai, the Battle of Zama, uh, 202 BC. Um, and we talk about the Punic Wars, the Carthaginians, uh, Carthaginians fighting against Rome. We, we deal with this in the course. The Moors, according to George G.M. James in uh, his book, Stolen Legacy, were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system the custodian of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. Uh, these teachings will bring Europe out of the dark ages. Okay. And there's a good article from national geographic 
uh, called Who Are the Moors? Who Are the Moors? Now, the word Moor, M-O-O-R, is derived from the Greek word Maros, Maros, M-A-U-R-O-S, which literally means black or a very dark color. The Romans adopt this word and call them Mari, Mari. The Mari were a Northwest African people who were very dark skinned. The Romans were refer to uh, the region of Northwest Africa. They were referred to the region of Northwest Africa as Mauritania, Mauritania, which uh, Mauritania is Latin and it means the land of the black skinned people, the land of the black skinned people. You'll also uh, hear the term Marish. OK, if and now Romans later adopt the word as a reference for the black skinned inhabitants they encountered in Africa. Now, if you, now if you read Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, uh, pages 527 and 187 of Golden Age of the Moor, this book right here. Uh, breaks down this information okay and this is one of the books that we use as reference in the course the 12 week uh course you don't have to buy in these books to follow along in the class we show you excerpts on the screen also you don't have to be present in the class because we do the sessions live but they're all archived and recorded so you can go back and watch it anytime we don't give tests don't take attendance anything like that okay uh, so, and then when we look at the, the, uh, Moors invading, uh, into the, in the Iberian Peninsula, 711 AD led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad, uh, in 711, the bow Tariq crossed the straits and disembarked near a rock promontory, which, uh, from that day since has borne his name called Jebel Tariq, Jebel Tariq or Tariq's mountain. We, now we know it as Gibraltar or the rock of Gibraltar. OK, Gibraltar comes from Jebel Tariq, OK, named after an African man, named after a Moor. All right. In, in August 711 A.D., Tariq won paramount victory over the opposing European army. On the eve of that battle, Tariq is alleged to have uh, roused his troops with the following words. My brethren, the enemy is before you. The sea is behind. Whither would ye fall? whither would ye fly follow your general i am resolved either to lose my life or to trample on the prostrate king of the romans now wasting no time to relish his victory Tariq ibn ziyad pushed on uh pushed on with his dashing and seemingly tireless morris cavalry to the spanish city of toledo within a month's time general Tariq ibn ziyad had effectively terminated european dominance of the iberian peninsula this comes from a, a excellent article written by uh, Renoko Rashidi called Moors, Saints, Knights, and Kings, the African Presence in Medieval and Renaissance Europe. Uh, this is uh, from AtlantaBlackStar.com, June 1st, 2014. Okay, and we have to understand Christopher Columbus to understand the transatlantic slave trade. So we deal with Columbus in the book. Uh, in the in the course, one of the books that we um, uh, look at is Christopher Columbus in the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by uh, Dr. John Henrik Clark. All right. Now, Columbus was a Genoese navigator and explorer whose whose transatlantic uh, voyages opened the way for European exploration, exploitation and colonization of the Americas. He began his career as a young seaman in the Portuguese merchant marine. OK, so um, he, he, he's uh, born in 1451 in Genoa, Italy, and he dies in 1506 in, in Spain. Now, what was Columbus looking for? Columbus was convinced that he'll find a new and lucrative sea route to the Orient by sailing west to find silk, tea, spices, gold, etc. This was big business in the 15th century. Columbus intended to chart a Western sea route to China, India, and the fabled gold and spice islands of Asia. So he's trying to uh, go West to eventually go East. Instead, he landed in the Bahamas, becoming the first European to uh, explore the America since the Vikings set up, the, uh, set up colonies in Greenland and Newfoundland 
during the 10th century. Now, Europeans lost their trading route to Asia because of the fall of Constant, uh, Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks. Uh, Europe is going to lose its most uh, popular route, its, its, its popular uh, sea route. Now, the Ottoman Turks capture Constantinople and thus divert the trade in Eastern European slaves away from the Mediterranean to Islamic markets. The Italians increasingly increasingly look to North Africa as their source for slaves. OK, so this is around uh, 1453 common era. Uh, Columbus was determined to find a direct water route west from Europe to Asia, but he never did. OK, he never found that water route he was looking for. What he did find was it was Hispaniola and Puerto Rico and Honduras and Jamaica and Trinidad and Panama. And, you know, he, that's he did find that. So Columbus went on four voyages. He never came to the land that we call the United States of America, uh, as I said. So in the class, we go through and look at where Columbus went. Now, what was the transatlantic slave trade? The transatlantic slave trade was the widespread enslavement of diverse peoples for economic and political gain and has played a fundamental role um, in the uh, fundamental role uh, throughout human history in the development of nations, okay, or, or the or the slave trade has, okay, the uh, the slave trade. Ancient Greek and, and Roman societies operated by using slave labor, as did many European countries in the modern period. Early, uh, as early as the uh, Middle Ages, Mediterranean cities were supplied with Moorish black slaves from Muslim countries in north africa now by comparison the slave trade okay which deals with the transatlantic slave trade which deals with the transatlantic slave trade is a term which has grown to be associated specifically with the transatlantic or triangular trade that spanned four centuries roughly between 1518 to sources say 1865 but really 1888 because brazil doesn't abolish slavery to 1888 it involved three continents, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, and was responsible for human suffering on an unprecedented scale. Now, you'll see some sources, and we, we, we look at this in, in the class, you'll see some sources that begin the transatlantic slave trade in 1518. Okay, so that's what's called the transatlantic slave trade proper, and that's after the Asiento de Negros, okay? That's after the Asiento de Negros, signed by King Charles V in August of 1518, which is a license that's uh, being given to um, uh, European nations and slave traders to provide Spanish colonies with uh, enslaved African people. All right. So by comparison, the slave trade is a term which was which has grown to be associated specifically with the transatlantic or triangular trade now transatlantic slave trade really goes back to about 1441 when the portuguese get involved anton gonzalez uh takes uh 12 africans out of uh, mauritania and takes them back to portugal okay so the portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade and then they're going to be followed quickly by spain and you look at a map spain and portugal are right next to each other and this is where the moors are going into in 711 AD. Okay, how you all like this type of information? Let me know. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Post your comments here. Now, slavery comes to the New World. Okay, African slaves were first brought to the New World shortly after its discovery or uncovery by uh, Christopher Columbus. Legend has it that one slave was um, included in his original crew, crew and they could be found in Hispaniola, site of present day Haiti, as early as 1501. Now, upon uh, his, his arrival in the Bahamas, Columbus himself captured seven of the natives for their education. On his return to Spain, however, the slave trade proper only began in 1518 when the first black cargo when the first black cargo direct 
uh, from Africa landed in the West Indies. Okay, so this is after the, uh, this is as a result of the Asiento de Negros, okay, signed in August of 1518 by King Charles V. Now, the importation of uh, black slaves or African, uh, African slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, Bartolomeu de las Casas, whose support of African slavery was motivated by humanitarian concern. So de las Casas travels on some of Columbus's voyages. And he said that the native people had suffered enough, native Americans had suffered enough, the populations were being decimated and that, um, and that, um, they should focus on uh Europeans should focus on enslaving Africans primarily and to a lesser extent Europeans and stop enslaving Native Americans and try to save Native American souls. Okay, this is Bartolomeu de las Casas. Now he's quickly going to regret that. Okay, and he is going to spend the rest of his life trying to abolish. The, the transatlantic slave trade but you know it's kind of it's it's a little late for that now Bartolomeu de las Casas right reverend bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites proving that in the early period slavery did not operate according to exclu exclusive racial demarcations he argued that it would save the indigenous uh, uh, American Indian populations or American Indian populations, which were which were not only dying out but engaging in large scale resistance, as they opposed their excessively harsh conditions. As a result, King Charles V of Spain um, agreed with Bartolomeu de las Casas, and he he agreed to the Asiento. Uh, de Negros or slave trading license in August of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trafficking. This dealt with uh, having a license to provide uh, African slaves to the uh, Spanish colonies. All right. So what what was the asiento de negros asiento de negros between the early 16th and mid 18th century was an agreement between the spanish crown and a private person or another sovereign power by which the latter was granted a monopoly in supplying african african slaves for the spanish colonies in the americas the contractor known as the asentista asentista agreed to pay a certain amount of money to the Spanish crown for uh, the monopoly and to deliver a stipulated number of male and female African slaves for sale in the American markets. All right. Britannica.com has some good information on the um, Asiento de Negros. Now, the first such contractor was a Genoese company uh that in 1517 agreed to supply 1000 uh african slaves over an eight year period in 1528 an agreement was reached with a german firm to supply 4000 slaves for its monopoly the firm paid 20000 ducats annually to the spanish crown each african slave was sold at a price not exceeding 45 ducats all right so when we deal with african-american history month or black history month and this year's annual theme is black resistance and black resistance movements it's also important to understand the history of african people prior to slavery prior to columbus coming to this land because oftentimes that is not talked about all right and if we understood that um our history did not start in this country in slavery. If we understood that this was our land stolen from us, if we understood that we were here for tens of thousands of years before Europeans came here, we were even here before Native Americans came into existence, it would have a huge uh, 
impact on the psychology of African people in this country. All right. So give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Um, be sure to register for the uh, free lecture that I'm doing, free Black History Month lecture that I'm doing on Saturday, February 11th. Um, it's uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the free Black History Month lecture, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then the um, class number one of my new 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, class number one will start up uh, Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. So you can register for both of these at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, around the homepage of our website. We also have the information here in the thread of the broadcast. As soon as you register, uh, there's bonus content that you can start watching. You can watch uh, last week's uh, lecture also, and uh, that's included as well when you register for the class. Uh, we did, and I ended up doing four hours um, last week to kick off uh, Black History Month. Okay, so we have uh, information here around the homepage of, uh, of the website for the uh, new online class. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. It's on sale, eighty dollars regularly, one hundred thirty dollars. You don't have to be present in class. Uh, don't take attendance or anything like that. And as soon as we finish the uh, the class is archived, so you can go back and watch it. Click right here to register for the full course. Uh, you you can click here as well. And we have the flyer here also. Okay. We deal with thousands of years of history and deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. The second class that I teach will start up Sunday, February 26, class number one, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1800 to 1968. And we go through and look at what leads to the Civil War taking place. We look at about 168, 170 years of history. Uh, we look at the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era. World War One, World War II, uh, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, to understand the laws and policies put in place that brought us to where we are today to understand where we need to go from here. And then also uh, each Saturday in February, 12 noon, Eastern Standard Time, I'm doing free Black History Month lectures as well. So you register for that here uh, also. That'll be 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's, and it's centering around Black resistance movements, Black resistance movements. Black resistance is the uh, annual theme for Black History Month 2023, okay? So visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and we have all that information there, and also information on uh, my radio show, the African History Network show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit, and uh, we also broadcast on our social media platforms, uh, Facebook and YouTube um, as well. OK, so we have our social media platforms there on the homepage of our website. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember, the African History Network, you focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent. Uh, you can advertise with the African History Network uh, as well. Uh, advertise your black owned business for Black History Month. Current promotion, buy one month, get one month free. Buy one month, get one month free. Uh, email us uh, through the website or email us at AHN show at the African History Network .com. We have three advertising packages uh, to help you reach thousands of people across the country. And also you, we'll, we'll put your uh, uh, commercial into the uh, rebroadcast of, of these shows that I do, as well as into the audio podcast of these shows. We're on nine different audio podcast platforms like iTunes, CastBox, iHeartRadio, FM Player, TuneIn. So we have three different um, advertising packages uh, also. OK, so we have that information uh, at our website as well. When you scroll down uh, past the information for the classes and we also have information dealing with my uh, uh, have uh, lectures in digital download format that you can um, order as well. Advertise with the African History Network, three uh, new ad packages to choose from. Okay, email us at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, we also have 
this uh, 15 lecture download bundle pack of 15 of my lectures, um, African History Awakens the African Mind from Mental Death. That's on sale, $50. That's a $150 value. So you can uh, order that as well. It makes a great, um, that, that's uh, a great bundle pack for learning during Black History Month. All right. Okay, and that's still on sale for a little while longer. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever, and we'll talk to you uh, next time. Peace.